I'm Peter Reinhardt. Welcome to Pizza Talk, presented by Pizza Quest. And we are here today with our expanding panel of pizza yodis. These are the guys that, that uh, really are the, the masters of dough and pizzas, of course, but we're really focusing with this panel on dough, on fermentation and all aspects of, uh, you know, of how to do, uh, improve your dough and, and, and take it to the next level. We've, we've had a few sessions already, and then the last time we met, uh, we talked about yeast fermentation, commercial yeast, which has been the, sort of the standard for so long, but now we're seeing that natural fermentation is getting traction everywhere. And so we've asked Dan Richer, who's, who's uh, been on with us uh, by himself, but now we want him to be part of this panel to add the voice of the sort of the natural fermentation side. And maybe we have a little bit of a, a little bit of a throw, give and take regarding uh, the pros and cons of each. I know Dan, you're doing both, you know, straight, uh, straight natural, but also you're doing some spike dough. We're using a combo of commercial yeast and natural fermentation. So uh, I'll just I'll just get the ball rolling, and any of you jump in at any time. You can ask each other questions, uh, and we're just going to try to anticipate some some of the things that our viewers would like to know as well. So um, Dan, why don't we start with you, since we're going to move into the natural fermentation, and tell us, you know, why you have moved in that direction at Raza. But, by the way, Dan Dan is the owner and creator of Raza in uh, Jersey City, New Jersey, and uh, getting international. Uh, acclaim and uh on my bucket list of places i have to get to when the planes start running again so uh, every everyone raves about your pizza and you're doing more than just fermentation there you're doing a lot of other you know sort of uh farm to table hands-on uh everything you're making your own butter everything we want to hear all about that again but let's focus on why you went with the natural fermentation yeah i i just think the um the natural fermentation provides uh, the flavors that I'm looking for in pizza, which are these complex flavors of fermentation um, with a tinge of acidity, uh, and we're able to do it in um, with ingredients that are just so completely pure and natural, and uh, the flavors are really what I'm after. And there's a little bit of the uh, the challenge that I love about it. Um, I feel like it's constantly changing. It's constantly evolving. Um, we are really tied to the, um, the seasons. Uh, and it's a challenge every single day trying to maintain a great product. And I like that challenge. And I know that at, at Raza, you are like like Brian. You're doing most of your fermentation, or maybe all of your fermentation, uh, at room temperature on the floor, right? You're not working with with uh, retarding and, and long overnight fermentations, correct? We do an overnight. We have a bunch of different recipes, oh, okay. uh, a bunch of different formula, um, and some of them are same day, uh, and some of them are overnight. We have a two day recipe. Uh, so, you have, so you are able to, you have ref, enough refrigeration to handle that as well. And John, barely. of course, at, at, uh, at Metro Pizza in Las Vegas, he's got ample refrigeration. So he, his doughs tend to be more on the long fermentation side. And, and John, you're finding that in, for your doughs, the longer fermentations give you the performance you're looking for. Right. And Brian and I talked about that la the last time we spoke, that it's, it's really a matter of different ways of getting to the same place. You know, um, you know, I think Dan Dan hit it on the head. You know, it's what you always say about the rule of flavor. Flavor rules. You know, and it's it's right. having a it's having a a clear vision of what you want your dough to perform like, what you want it to taste like, of course, and what you want the textures to be like. And there's different ways of getting there. One way of getting there is with with a overnight or two day fermentation using a using natural fermentation or a pre ferment or a starter. And the way that we do it is just long fermentation. You know, so you, know, you, use know, a start, you don't need to use a, a sponge or a preferment. You just give it time. Time is your is right. Your we're, you know, we're always with our with our dough. We're always manipulating time. That's you know, that's where the flavors are coming from, and the textures are coming from, and the extensibility. But I think that um, you know, there's people. Dan, Dan's doing it for all the right reasons. You know, but there's people that are doing it and they become zealots. You know, they become like these converts to natural fermentation, and then everybody that's not doing natural fermentation is some sort of a heretic. 
right? the club. you know, and that's just not true. You know, there's, there, you know, especially these guys that talk about digestibility, you know, yeah, digestibility is a wonderful thing. Prove it. Yeah. Show me the yeah. science. Yeah. You know, show me the science that, a, that, a, a, a naturally fermented dough is more, is more digestible than a dough that uses, that uses commercial yeast and, and ferments for five days. We, all we all we hear are anecdotes. We don't have anything, you know, hard and fast. So I so I, we should probably keep the focus on flavor since that's something that we can. Yeah, you know, I mean, that's you know that's really something that you can you can demonstrate. Yeah, you know you can say you know it's a matter of preference. I like this flavor. Okay, so that's it. That's that's your that's your answer to how to get the flavor that you're looking for. That's well, a legitimate Dan, reason. Dan, you make it on any given night at Rasa. You're doing three different doughs sometimes. And the customers don't know which dough they're going to get necessarily. It's the one that you you're working on at that moment. Uh, some of them are, uh, are are spiked with a little bit of commercial yeast. Some are not. Correct. You do some that are just pure uh, That's right. all starter. And what are you finding? Number, well, two questions. One, are you finding the some of the differences in texture and flavor? Uh, you know, in those by using yeast and and the, the positives of why you why that makes a, a difference for you. And also, are you getting any blowback in, in terms of what John was just saying? From people who are purists, who who get offended by the fact that you're not doing a hundred percent pure uh, natural fermentation only, but are spiking it with with yeast. Yeah, I tend to not think about what anyone else <laughs> says or thinks or feels. I'm just trying to do me, and I'm, I'm trying to learn with every batch of dough that we make. Um, like I said last time, we do have three to four different doughs going at the same time, uh, but the the differences are just absolutely minuscule uh, but it's the it's these fine details that really teach us a lot about the differences um, I mean for me when we spike it with a tiny bit of commercial yeast uh, now we're talking about instant yeast and we're talking uh, seven hundredths of a percent by weight of the flour so that's really like a, just a pinch yeah it's the, it's the smallest amount so for every hundred balls of pizza dough we're talking 10 grams of yeast it's a very very small amount but it, we i i've noticed that we get better texture it's it's subtly lighter and a little bit airier than i can get with 100 percent natural fermentation it's just such a vigorous gas producer and the, those bubbles are even the the minuscule ones are contributing to a slightly lighter texture than completely naturally fermented. Is the time accelerated when you use these? Are you able to use that dough sooner than the ones that don't have the yeast spike? Typically, yes and no. You know, it, it all depends on how we manipulate it. Um, but yeah, bulk fermentation can be shorter. Um, but for us, how we do it, it's not. Um, there's just, there's so many different ways to manipulate it. I got a question. Are, are you using the spike on the days that you're closed? Is that when you're spiking your... Uh, yes. You get it yeah, so long to get it ready because you're closed one day or two days a week? One day a week. So the day that we are closed, the following day, all of the batches get a small amount of commercial yeast. Right. The spike. Uh, yeah, all of them, because the starter hasn't been fed in, you know, 36 hours or whatever it is. And uh, that we, we don't even attempt to do a, an all natural fermentation because it requires a very vigorous, active, vibrant starter. Uh, yeah, well, a lot of people don't talk about is the fact that uh, the rate and hydration and temperature of your feedings completely affect how your flavor profile activity of the starter is going to uh, perform. And totally. A lot of people are just like, well, I just do natural fermentation. I'm like, well, okay. <laughs> how are you feeding it? Like the way you like eight hours, six hours, 12 hours, all these different feeding schedules and the, the, the temperature, whether it be like some people put it in the walk-in, which I don't really understand, but, um, the, the ratios of feedings and you, you get you get the, the the starter actually starts balancing out on acid level but also becomes really vigorous you start doing like really high uh, aggressive feedings and it 
it wants to go. It's it's a living organism. It really it's it's kind of the it's the most complicated thing I've ever done in baking, working with uh, wild yeast. Mm. You find you find the same thing, right? Like it, absolutely. When you, and you're, it keeps me you're, you're training it. You're training it to do what you want it to do, right? Or yeah. it's training you. Right. Well, yeah. not. <laughs> They're, they're I, you know, one of the things I love about this panel here is that all three of you have world-class pizzerias, uh, uh, Pizza Shoals in Portland, which is Brian's. We've got Metro in Las Vegas with John. We've got Rasa in Jersey City. Um, and yet you're all doing it differently. You're all doing it your own way. And also one of the other things is, is you're all doing it your own way. You're not following some kind of a, a standard blueprint. You're, you're, you're making your own mistakes. You're learning from doing. And your pizzas and doughs have evolved over the years that you've been doing it. Uh, and as, uh, as uh, Dan and I spoke last time, it really is a never ending process. I think Brian, you've said the same thing, John, you've said it never ends. The learning never ends with this. So that you're, anytime somebody comes to your place, unlike going to Starbucks where every muffin is gonna be the same every single time you go there, when they come to your places, there's a possibility they're gonna get their expectations met, but it may not be the same pizza that they had the last time they were there. Yeah, but on, 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 that, on that point, um, one of the things I'm, I'm having the hardest time dealing with is that people have been expecting the same thing for, what now, 16 years? So I kind of feel handcuffed, um, if, that makes a, if that makes any sense. Like, like you're in a box there with them. Yeah, people expect, like, when they want to come in, like, they have this, uh, you know, it's, and, you know, uh, I hate to keep quoting Chris Bianco, but um, might as well everybody else is. <laughs> yeah, I know. Uh, but you know, when we worked in Denver together, he said he was like people like the reason why his menu doesn't change because he wants people to have you know it's like there's a certain level of expectancy that it's going to be this certain way. They can they can count on it. I can't remember his exact quote, but it was like people like to have things be. Assemblage of normal and yeah, that's familiarity. I'm constantly, I'm constantly evolving, but I can only evolve so much, and I feel kind of handcuffed. Which I think one of the things that Chris uh, is pointing to is that uh, rather than try to squeeze a new concept into what he's already doing, where people have an idea of what they want, he just opens a different concept restaurant, and he and he does his new his slices here and his uh, Sicilians over there, and that yeah. may be that may be the way that you have to go when you're. When your customers, they want something to be, you know, to, to be familiar to them at, at the level of expectation. That's why they came back. They want to, they want to relive the quote was like that wild experience. I think his quote was like some a semblance of normalcy. Like people need to count on something always being there for them. And when, you know, you, when you go to a restaurant and you experience something and you love it, you want to go back to have that same experience. So. For me, um, when I experiment, I do only sourdough <laughs> experiments. Um, but here at a, at a pizza, people have expected this this level that we've created and the, yeah. the original ideal that I, I set. And I, I can't really change it. I'm kind of handcuffed. Well, you're going to have to open up a new place next door. Nope. <laughs> And that's, well, that's it. Right. So that's, that, that that's speaks to the other things that everybody has to find <laughs> their place. There's someone like Tony, he's opening up 12, 20 concepts. Uh, but some people are just happy just doing the, the thing that they want to do, that they love doing, that they can do over and over again. John, how many generations of, have you been baking pizza with you and your dad? Uh, that, and and you're, you're in your 50th plus year of baking. And yeah, and your, your dad's 20 some years before that. Uh, and yet it never gets old for you. It doesn't get old because I, it's that 60s hippies rebel in me, you know, that I, I'm not a fan of culinary fascism, <laughs> you know, I, I want to do what I want to do, you know, and, yeah. you know, and put it out there and you hope that, the, that it resonates with the customers. And I think the trick is to not, not give them too radical a change. You know, I have people all the time that are saying to me, your pizza hasn't changed in 40 years. It's changed tremendously in 40 years, but it changed and it changed in a way that they could they could adapt to. You know, some of them, of course, are never going to accept any any form of change. But I think, you know, as as leaders in our industry, as owners of a business, we have to continue to evolve and we have to do it in a way that 
it's gratifying to us as well. Of course, but uh, at the same time, you're always tweaking things mildly. You're not doing right. like radical changes. You're, yeah. you're, you're kind of like poking the fire. You know, totally. if, you've, if you've changed it over the course of 40 years and, and nobody notices that you changed it, I think that's a, that's a good thing. Of course. You know, because what they're really saying is that the experience is still great. The quality is there. You know, we know that it's different. Right. We changed it for all the right reasons. We changed it for reasons of improvement. And that's, you know, that's the motivation. But I think, um, I think you know, it can be pretty boring. You know, does, does a musician want to go and play the, play the same songs every night and play them exactly the same way? Sometimes yes, but usually no. <laughs> you know, if you're a nostalgia act, yes, but we're not building museums. We're building, right. we, our pizzerias are a living, organic, breathing entity. Well, you know, I'm just trying to imagine that as some of the people that are watching this now, some are pizza makers, some are pizza operators, you know, the restaurant owners that, that are not on the, on the you know, uh, assembly line, but they're running a business. And, and so their focus is on what's making their customers happy. And then to have a guy come in, let's say uh, uh, an employee and says, hey, I can make, make this pizza even better than it was. Sometimes that's not always good news to an owner who feels like he's dialed in his, his business formula. So there's always this tension, and I think it's a necessary tension between you know meeting the customer's demands, but all, but this need to grow and expand and continue to press the the boundaries of what's possible. Uh, you know, we've been focusing on the fact that you guys are boundary pushers, uh, but you but like you say, you also have to do it incrementally from the customer standpoint. Right, and then the, the ingredients are always changing, right? So the flour is never the same, the cheese is never the same, the sauce is never the same. You yeah. have to you, you have to adapt with it and and make little tweaks to give that customer the same experience because the last thing you want to do is go into a restaurant. I mean, I'm a consumer too, so I hate going into a restaurant and having a mind blowing experience. And then I take all my friends there, and then the next time I go there, it's it's not nearly what I had that first time around. So you have to. You, you know, it's trying to, it's like, it's a type of balance, you know? Yeah, but you know, uh, Brian, you hit on something that's really important, that um, if, if you went to that restaurant, you had a mind-blowing experience the first time you went there, and you go back and it's the same exact experience, it's not mind-blowing anymore. You know, because, yeah. you know, so... Right. So, so because you're not the same person the second time you walked in, of course. You, now have, you now have this other expectation based on your on your emotional reaction to what you experienced the first time. So we have that all the time. We go into a place and it's great. We bring all our friends and it's not. And you're like, wow, it wasn't as good as it was the last time. It might have been identical to the last time, but you've changed. That could be. That's, yeah. part that's of a it. very good point. That's, that's, that's and I think I think that's where hospitality really comes in into play. Right and developing that relationship over a long period of time. And that's, that relationship is, is crucial. It's that, that bond and that level of trust that they have where they know that they're on this journey with me. And every day I'm working my hardest to make it better than it was the day before. And that's how we're able to make those subtle changes on a day-to-day -day basis because they trust us, they believe in us, and they, they, want, it to, they want to come on this journey with us. I think yeah. the intent actually transcends. People sense the intent, right? I think if everybody is on the board of making the best product we can, giving the best service we can, people feel that. It, it, it's, it's, it's kind of uh, electric. Well, we know that part of that mind-blowing experience that people have uh, it has to go beyond just the taste of the food itself. It has to be the whole experience. And what Dan's saying about relationship is a big part of that. Right. You guys are not just in the restaurant business, you're in the relationship business. And, uh, and the goal, of course, is to have people come back over and over again and build those relationships. Sure. Well, well, this is probably a good place for us to take a step back for a second. We're, we're going to take a break. And when we come back, Brian is going to take us into his kitchen. And he's going to show us a little bit of how he does it, what his, what his method is, so to speak. We, he's already shown us how he does his mixing. Uh, in, in our last segment, this time he's going to show us how he takes the dough, stretches it out, turns it into a pizza in the a pizza shoal style, 
the one that he's been boxed into now by his customers because they won't let him change. It's got to be this good every single time, no matter the, even though it's changing every single time. It's, so, always, it's always evolving. So, so, so our goal when we come back is that Brian is going to try to blow our minds because it's a okay. mind blowing pizza. And we're going to all three of us will throw questions at you, Brian, while you're doing it. Okay. okay? All right. So uh, join us again. Uh, we're, we're doing pizza talk. Uh, presented by Pizza Quest with our pizza yodis. We've got Dan Richer, we've got John Arena, Brian Spangler, and we'll be back next time in the kitchen with Brian. I want to take a moment to thank Forno Bravo for making all of this possible. We've been working together with Forno Bravo for 10 years now since we started Pizza Quest, and it wouldn't be possible without their support, but also without their ovens. They make incredible ovens. All of the Pizza Quest team members have uh, Forno Bravo ovens at home. And if you're looking for one, whether for work and professional use or for the home, check out their catalog at fornobravo.com and get inspired. Welcome to Pizza Talk on Pizza Quest. And I'm Peter Reinhardt with John Arena, Brian Spangler, Dan Richer uh, of uh, three of the greatest pizzerias in America and the world. And in this segment, Brian is going to take us from where he's sitting in the restaurant back into the kitchen and he's going to show us how he stretches out the dough and turns it into a, uh, a pizza in the style of a pizza shows, which is really, in my mind, is my, you know, what he's done on the West Coast is recreate my childhood memory of a great New Haven style pizza without using coal. <laughs> how does he do it? That's what we're going to find out. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm going to walk you through the restaurant. Yeah. Let's get through here. All right. We're following you. So the restaurant obviously is not no longer not being used as a restaurant these days. It's more no. of a staging area, right? We're one hundred percent to go, just like everybody else. You remember that girl? Hey, Peter. Hey, how you doing? Good. Peter? How you doing? <laughs> so, so, so it's uh, you want to introduce Kim to everybody? That's uh, my wife, Kim. She is the unsung hero of the Pizza Shoals. She does not get enough credit for uh, how we've evolved and formulated this business. So everybody talks about me, but you know what? This girl, Love you, baby. <laughs> she's super important. Yes. I couldn't yeah, find what And then here's the, uh, and you can see this. This is the article 16 years ago that blew us up. And there's, there's somebody right here. <laughs> Having my first bite of a, a Pizza Shoals pizza. Yeah, 16 years ago, dude. A very different pizza back then. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. I was still learning to stretch. I was yeah. still, you know, experimenting and, uh, yeah, failing, falling on my face. But it was, but you got off to a pretty good start because start, you started with a great pizza and you just kept getting better and better. Yeah, and you guys remember Andres? Andres, good to see you again. My good man. Another. So we're gonna make some pizzas. He's gonna help me kind of hold the camera and or the computer, so to speak. Make sure we get a good video of me stretching and all this shit. All right. So we got both of you in the. It's a two shot right now, but it's about to be a, a Brian. What, what's the first step of the, what you're gonna do? Well, we're gonna stretch out the pizza, and we're just gonna make a basic plain cheese pie. I think that's, uh, for me, that's the end all be all. If you can make a good cheese pizza, then. So let's talk while you're doing it. Let's talk a little, little bit, for those who have not been in the earlier segments, what is it about, how's your dough made? How big is the dough ball? What, what kind of flour are you using? Um, right now we're using uh, central milling flour. We're using a combination for the pouliche. We're using Keith's Best, which has a little bit of spring wheat as well as winter wheat and a little skosh of ascorbic acid. Uh, the ascorbic acid reinforces the gluten, which gives us that uh, safety net during the long 14-hour uh, pre-ferment that we do overnight, um, so it doesn't blow out. I see. And then the the remainder, the 75% of the the flour is is artisan, which is 100% uh, winter red wheat, um, to give you that nice delicate kind of crumb and a little crackly on the crust. Well, we're gonna, we're gonna probably have a whole show and, and maybe we'll have them come on with, with our dough panel 
uh, with Nikki Justo in the future from Central Milling, and we'll get him to really break down what these, you know, what all these different terms that you're, you're talking about, winter wheat, spring wheat, et cetera. For those who aren't up to speed on all that, we'll get Nikki to break it down for us. But, but for now, it's good to know that you're using a blend of a couple of different kinds of things. Yeah, then it's, you know, that's that's the evolution of what we've been talking about, how you're moving with the floor. We used to just use 100% uh, artisan flour, and then we were having problems with our pre-ferment over, uh, it was blowing out. So we, um, I, <coughs> I was like, okay, so let's try this Keith Best that has ascorbic acid that'll give us that kind of what I call a CYA, a cover your ass. Ah, um, safety net. Safety net. Yeah, sport. I I always found that the ascorbic acid uh, took the place of uh, 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 bromates in bread too, and it helped with a little bit of, of oven cost. Yeah, you get some of that too. Yeah, but the ascorbic acid's uh, natural. It's a uh, it's a uh, just re it just strengthens the bonds and ever since we made that move uh we didn't have any problems with the the uh the, the pre-ferment blowing out and um it gave us that nice crispiness also to the, the structure of the, the crust so it gets crackly back to the um the outside of the uh, crust as it baked okay so, all so right and uh make a pizza one or two Go ahead, doing? yeah. Go ahead, and put put one or two together for us, and we'll get them in. And I want I, I know the people who are watching are going to want to see, you know, what it comes out looking like too, because okay. the way your pizzas come go in and go out come out look very different from the way that Dan's pizzas uh, come out of the oven. He's baking in a total, totally different way with a different sort of end end game in mind. And then and then John, you see if the if, if this pizza that Brian's making. Since at, at Metro, you really celebrate regional pizzas from of all different styles. See which one on your menu this is the closest to uh, from Metro Pizza, too. Okay. Yeah, this is like, you know, a classic neo-Neapolitan style pizza. You know, the inspiration, like, for me, like, Ground Zero is Patsy's in East Harlem. To me, uh, that's kind of like, that was my brass ring that I was reaching for. But with my, with our own stamp on it, right? I'm not trying to replicate anything but exactly. that was the inspiration for everything but just that that basic simplicity of you know, the sauce dough cheese ratio i saw like going to like l and spumoni gardens uh how they were using sliced cheese sauce uh -huh. on top, which is now becoming the new hot thing so we've been doing that from day one we experimented with that back in the bakery days and uh, for us, it just gave us the better mouthfeel. Um, and not only that, but it kept the moisture from, it kept with the cheese adhering to the dough, it kept the moisture from sogging out the dough. So, well, I guess when you stretch it, we'll see, but you, it sounds like what you're saying is you're going to put the cheese down before the sauce. Right. And yeah. good man, Andres over here is going to, when I'm done stretching this out, I'm going to, Kind of like hold the, the computer and we'll, we'll we'll do a little tag team over here. So, how big how big did you say your dough balls weigh? These are six hundred and sixty grams for a two can of pizza. Six sixty. Okay, got to do a quick calculation here, right? So about twenty three ounces. About that, yeah. Because I know, all, are all your pizzas at, at a show's um, all the same size? You don't have a large and a small. It's all one size. One size. All right. So we're talking about a pretty good size pizza, and you stretch it out to, as we're going to see, about what, 18 inches? Going back to inspiration and, you know, gold standards, for me, it's, it, I need to, personally, I need to have that fold. You know, when I, when I was growing up and I, get that 18 to 20 inch pizza and you fold it over and get that New York fold. There was yeah. something about that that resonated with me that was part of the whole process. Uh -huh. And there's no right or wrong. It's just, it's, yeah. you know, my well, inspiration. And well, so you had, you, you had a vision in mind of what you were trying to pay homage to. And, and uh, Dan, your pizzas are very different. What, what's the largest, pizza you make at at uh, rasa we do 12s so oh, we're baking okay. in a in a wood-fired oven small oh, oven 
yeah, so they're, they're much smaller pizzas. And, yeah. and in, when you were envisioning, because again, you're doing Neapolitan style pizza, but really in your own original way, you know, you're doing yeah, it so your way. I'm kind of like anti-Neapolitan. We, we break every single rule. There's nothing, uh, the only similarity between what we do in Neapolitan pizza is the size yeah. is similar and we're baking with the same fuel source. It's a different oven. We're, we're looking for fundamentally very, very different characteristics in our and you, pizza. And, are, um, and you're not baking at 900 degrees? Or are you baking uh, lower, no. or lower? Yeah, way lower. Yeah. So yeah, so it's a different, different, it's your own style. You had an idea of what you yeah. were looking for. So we, we get a sense, Brian's looking for one that's sort of like that New York uh, slice that you can fold and kind of, you know, maybe put two on top of each other like John Travolta and walk down the street eating. Hey, exactly. Yeah. And then you've got, and then, and with, with your style, what were you, what were you going for at Rasa that, uh, you know, that you kind of have been, uh, that drove your vision for how to, so I, I actually broke, I broke down pizza into a list of about 40 different characteristics uh, of different uh, from from the textures that we were looking for to the colors that we're looking for, the way the cheese melts, the way the sauce reduces, the level of caramelization, dimensions, the size, all yeah. of it was was laid out and uh, and that became rots of pizza when when you put it all together and once once we realized all of those characteristics in the final product cool well you know while you're saying that i'm walking, looking over brian's shoulder and andres is, is uh it looks like he's got his sauce laid down so you must have put my horse right here andres yeah he's, he's making it happen so he laid his cheese down put some tomato sauce over that what's he putting on now uh so we have a combination of both aged mozzarella as well as, as, well as fresh mozzarella so that is it's all grande cheese. Uh, slice, we slice our uh, whole milk, aged mozzarella, and then we uh, get the logs. I can't the name of that. Tepolini. Um And then we put a little bit of that on top. And then we're going to hit it with uh, a little bit of uh, grana padana right on top of the sauce so that it melts oh. into the sauce. Yeah. And then he's going to hit it with a little bit of olive oil here. And then, and then it's going in. Now, so this uh, is this. He's already put the olive oil. Sorry. On your menu, is this just called a sauce and cheese pizza, or is there a name for this? I call it plain pie. Plain pie. All right. So, and then, um, what should we look for when it's baking? Is it going to puff much around the edge, or is it going to stay kind of small and crisp? Oh no, it's going to puff a lot. I'm going to hold up the, the the computer. We'll watch it. Luckily, we have one of these pizza master ovens, so you can actually see inside the oven. That was not there the last time I came to Shoals. You guys had a much older oven there. We had a Baker's Pride back in the day. That's you what know. I remember. Well, what temperature? Are you it's gonna load it up. What temperature are you baking at, Brian? Uh, the uh, Fahrenheit is six hundred degrees. The okay. uh, top setting is uh, the top element set at uh, seven. The bottom is set at three. These ovens, I've noticed over the years, have tempered out. We used to go, we used to go a little higher, um, but I think they've cured out enough where mm -hmm. these things actually get better with age. What? Uh, how long do they typically bake? This will probably take about four or five minutes. Okay, so while they're baking, let me ask John a question. You, you have pizzas. Obviously, pizzas like this on your menu, right? This, you this the pizza? We have something very similar. Can you uh, we have a pizza, pizza on our menu. It's called the Old New York. So obviously the same inspiration. It was based on a kind of a inspired by by Patsy's and and uh, and John's and the sauce. On, we put the sauce on top, so that's kind of a kind of a throwback to the Sicilian pizza at Pomoni Gardens. But it's basically the same same process: sliced mozzarella. The only difference is we're, we're baking at about five sixty five. I actually want a little bit of a longer bake. And it, uh, I, we go for about a seven and a half minute to eight minute bake. Right. To kind of crisp the pizza up and dry it and dry it dry it out a little bit. A little moisture absorption. A uh, little moisture evaporation. What kind of oven do you use, John? I'm using a Marcel gas oven in most of my stores. Um, two of my stores, I have old Baker's Prides, which I thought were great ovens, but I think they've changed quite a bit over the years. It seems so like. The this pizza master seems to be getting a lot of traction lately in the industry. Is this kind of the new, the new, the new toy on the, on the block? Definitely. I think that it came about because 
Uh, bread bakers were not afraid of electric ovens, the way pizza makers always were. Uh, and the, and the, 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 um, the quality of the electric ovens and the, and the flexibility has improved so much that you know, they're definitely the wave of the future. The Pizza Master is an amazing oven. Best pizzas I've ever made have been on the street in, in the Bronx using a Pizza Master. So is that something that you might would consider then as you open Yeah, def definitely. Uh -huh. Hey, John, what's the, what's the max temperature of, your, of the gas ovens? They say 650, but I've never been able to get it over, six, over 620. So I think yeah, that's, that's about, about max. What, what are you baking at, Dan? Ah, uh, it's hard to say. You got like a three to four minute bake? Yeah, a little bit shorter. Okay, so maybe yeah. 675, 700? Some, something like that. Yeah. It's just, it's so variable and we don't even think about the oven temperature because there's, it's three logs in there, two logs in there. Yeah, yeah. You know? Right. How long how is it? It's three, three logs hot, yeah. Okay, how long can you keep your hand in the oven before you have Exactly. Mm. How fast does the flour burn on the floor? There you go. Yeah. Right. And do you, do you ever in your in your version, Dan? Do you ever create any smoke? Do you throw sawdust on the logs or anything like that? You don't throw any any sort no. of smoke pillow or anything. Not at all. Not at all. And Brian, I saw is that that piece is off the deck now. Is it just being domed or what? No, it's on the deck. Is it? Oh, it looks like it's floating from on my on my on my screen. Oh, so it's it's sitting, probably because oh, of the glass, the, gla oh, okay. the glass window. Is it, is it just me or does it look like it's kind of like hovering above the deck? <laughs> and it's the reflection. It's, it's yeah. right on it's, the floor. I think Andres needs to turn it, give it a little spin. Yeah, it's going to be the light. Yeah. Can you guys see this well? Yeah. Uh, pretty yeah. good, yeah. Now, Brian, I, I didn't see when he made the pizza that he put... Brian, did you put the cheese down first and then splash the sauce, or did the sauce go yes. down first? What's that? Did the sauce go down first on that pie? No. Slice cheese, and then we put the sauce on top. Okay, so so it's a, really the same exact order as what we're doing on our... Just like what you're making in New York. Yeah. I, you know, we, we tried it during the three, almost four years that Kim and I, when we had the bakery, we're doing our Sunday pizza days. We tried it every which way but Sunday, and... We uh, we decided that we really liked the the sauce on top. It give a better mouth feel. Also, um, all the it created that that uh, barrier, the fat the fat barrier between the the dough and all the wet ingredients on top, so it would keep the the crust crisper. Yeah, I think and everybody would everything everybody would just melt to the cheese. So when you picked up a slice, nothing would come off. And that was another kind of bonus because one of my worst things about pizza is like taking a bite and the whole, all the cheese and everything coming off. Yeah, the that's the word. Some of it, some of it burns, some of it it burns on your lips, some of it gets on your shirt. <laughs> I think yeah, the, like, the melt of the please. cheese is a lot better too. Because the tomato is, is protecting the cheese from the heat of the oven. So the, the cheese is protecting the dough from the moisture coming the moisture off the sauce. Level. Yeah, so mushrooms, onions, you know, sauce, everything. So, hey, Brian, while, while we're finishing up the pizza, can you, can you hold up a slice of the cheese so we can see how thick you cut that? And Yeah, for sure. This is about out of the oven right now. So okay, good. good. Everything on that is? And, and, uh, so, and while we're talking about that cheese, yeah, so you yeah. talk, there you go. So you got a nice, oh, yeah. you got a, a pretty yeah. char around the, around the, on, huh? Oh yeah, no, yeah. That's, that's caramelization. That's flavor. That's flavor town. Yeah. To quote somebody uh, else. Did you say you're using full fat mozzarella? I'm sorry. Full fat, full fat mozzarella. Correct. Whole milk. And there it is. Oh man! Now if we could just pass it through the screen. Right. <laughs> so. So yeah, can you just show us a slice of the cheese before you know the, as you what, what they look like going on? Of course, yeah. Because we were we were too far from the camera uh, when when so he was. So we generally for an eighteen inch pizza are running uh, in grams. How many grams is that? Terrible. I've got a scale right here. It's like almost three quarters of a pound, believe it or not. Get this weighed out in grams. 
Are you guys slicing like, that? In, 19 in the slices restaurant? of cheese for an 18 inch pizza. 19 approximately. And we are running 275 grams of cheese for an 18 inch pizza. 275 per pizza. And so that's a slice. 10 ounces of cheese. Almost. It's, it's, what would that be? I still, my mind still thinks in ounces more than grams, even though I try to do everything. Not, we, we, we always, like, everything's been grams as far as baking, and but Kim did the, this is all Kim's job. Like, uh -huh. she, she figured out how much cheese to put on a pizza. So that's how thick or thin. Nice, yeah. But, and so, but it, it adds up to a lot of cheese. So what is this? This one slice of cheese weighs 18 grams. It's about three quarters of an ounce. And uh, yeah, so so nice you get to see. So so uh, Brian, how long do you typically when the when the pizza comes out and you've cut it till it gets to the table or to the customer? Uh, or, and do you hold it back for a minute just to kind of let it temper? Um, we don't. We uh, with in-house dining and currently with to-go dining, we just it, it's we're selling a uh, hundred and fifty eighteen-inch pizzas in four hours and it's gone. Um, but by the time it gets in the box and out to the or you know gets to the to the customer, it's cooled off a little bit. A little is, bit. If they're if they're here and they're ready, like there's been, there have been times where the pizza comes out and it's like the person's walking in the door and it's like perfect timing. We're using those uh, perfect crust pizza liners to uh, help ensure whip away the moisture and uh, the oil to uh, keep the integrity as best as we can. Because again, I think pizza boxes are coffins. Um, I'm not a fan of doing this, but you know, what else am I going to do? Right. Um, well, you, so you mitigate it by having a box that lets it breathe a little bit. Well, the pizza, uh, the, the pizza liners are, are kind of everything. Oh, by the way, let's get a little bit of, thanks buddy. Thank you guys. All right. How about, Hey, he's how about if there, you guys, okay? so he's going to be on the show a lot, right? We, we love seeing him. <laughs> we love having him. Uh, while, while you guys are standing there by the pizza, could you take a bite in so that we can uh, vicariously enjoy it with you? Sure. We want to see a little bit. Part. You want to see a little bit of that cheese pull. No so tips. Yeah, baby. There's that Ben. And, no tips, and what's the under, what's the undercrust look like? Are you got you got a pretty good char on there? Uh huh. Nice and nice and caramel. Perfect. Yeah, there it is. Well, I'm uh, for me like uh, cheese pizza. It's like I was talking to someone the other day. It's like macaroni and cheese. You can add shit to macaroni and cheese, but why do you need to? It's already perfect. Never. There you go. Exactly. Well, that's a good place for us to take a break. And uh, Brian, thank you so much for walking us through the uh, Apisa Shoals experience. Andres, thank you for being back. We're going to see you again and again. You know, he's going to be here all the time. He, I'm going to make him a TV star. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Uh, and uh, when we come back on our next episode, Dan is going to talk a little bit about his process a little bit more, right? You got a little show and tell for us Good. today? Good. 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 Excellent. Good. And then and so we'll continue our discussion about fermentation. Hey, Peter. About, about all these. So there's the, there's the pull, the cheese pull. A perfect time to say thank you for joining us on Pizza Talk, presented by Pizza Quest with our pizza yodis, Dan, uh, Brian, and John. Awesome. See you next time. See you soon.